So my name is Aisha. Uh, I'm from the northern western region of Pakistan, um, a few hundred miles underneath the Himalayan mountains. And besides this river called the Chenab River, which runs all the way from the Himalayas all down through uh, the, the subcontinent of India. And although I grew up in a religiously like a Muslim family, my mother's side of the family is native to Pakistan. And so a lot of our beliefs were entwined within both like religion, but also ancestral beliefs. And in my culture, we we're taught from an early age that the earth is a conscious being that it is aware of each human and animal residing on it from the ants to the elephants. And not only does the earth feel our footsteps, but it is aware of the tone with which we take them. And not only that, but it keeps a record and nature keeps a record. And this kind of um, epistemology was very pivotal in my navigating of of the climate movement. Um, so much so that we are taught just like animals and plants evolve to survive in their specific habitats, humans also evolve to survive in their specific habitats. Um, that there is symbiosis between mountains and the mountain people, between the desert and the people of the desert, between um, the people who have grown by the river and river dwellers. So humans within their different um, uh, topographies are also uh, evolved to be able to fit and survive in those specific habitats. And not only that, but when they are removed or forced to leave, um, the feeling of loss is both mutual between the earth and the human. And that the sense of homelessness is one of the most violent things that one person can inflict on another. The Middle East and North Africa is home to more than half of the world's crude oil and a third of its natural gas reserves. The wars that have been waged since the 1980s have not just been about imperialism, or establishing democracy. United States wars have been directly linked to resources, oil wars, um, and they've been driven by the desire to maintain control over these resources, generate profit for war profiteers, and establish international hegemony which has then led to not only the destruction of, of nature, but the complete demolition of governments, of whether they were democracies or dictatorships, human life, revolutionary movements, et cetera, et cetera. Today, the US Department of Defense has a larger annual carbon footprint than most countries on earth. I am talking to you from New York City, where our police force has a $9 billion budget. That is $5 billion more than the Ukrainian military. And also the US Defense Force is the single largest polluter on earth. It's, mili it's military present over the region of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran has cost the U.S. military more than $8 trillion since 1976. It has not only these wars for oil and these wars powered by oil have not only led to, like I said, the destruction of nature, but they've caused extreme carbon spikes in our atmosphere and the use of weapons that have depleted uranium by U.S. forces in places like Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan, and Libya have poisoned air 
and water quality. So much so that 30 years after we invaded Afghanistan, people are still suffering from defects of cancer and other, other like um, polluted, pollution related and tox, toxin related um, biological disabilities. The destruction of our planet, the situation of the climate crisis, all of this in totality has not been passive and it's not, have, it's not, um, it has not been the result of unintelligent leaders. It's all been very systematic and I don't think our, our world leaders are that incompetent. It's violent and it's absolutely disgusting that for the past 40, 50 years, when resource wars have been waged over black and brown people, um, our suffering, our pleads to, for the rights for a future, the right for innocence, the right for peace, etc., etc., were not acknowledged as absolutely fundamental rights. But now that the topic of climate change or climate destruction or the fear of natural disasters destroying your home has reached the global north. It's become a topic of elections and um, policy and politics. And it's caused people to come to the level of celebrity. And we have like massive discourse on it. But as long as those people, like I mentioned before, in Afghanistan are facing the effects of cancer because of depleted uranium, as long as those in Somalia are facing drought and those in Sudan are facing drought, which also is a direct result of US and UK foreign policy, the climate crisis is a residual effect of the wars led by white men. There is no way for us to get to climate justice or peace or equity if we keep allowing very powerful and handful of, of men to dictate who gets to live and who gets to die.